Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mary Poppins of Business Light Show. I'm really, really excited to have with us today a fantastic woman, Pilar Ortiz, the director of Virtual Not Distance. Today, we are going to dive into the world of hybrid working and answer the question of whether we are losing the opportunity of reimagining what it could be. And whilst we're there, we also share with you a lot of other tips and tools on how you can start looking at hybrid working and planning for it very differently. Pilar has been helping managers and organizations adopt online collaboration since 2016. So she has bag bags of knowledge with her. She's worked with all sorts of companies, big, small, private, public, and everything. She's delivered so many workshops and trainings. And now she's using her skills in audio to help organizations to connect even more, to connect their workforce through internal podcasting, which is a topic that I'm really passionate about. And if you're wondering, what is internal podcasting and why is that beneficial to my organization? Well, keep watching. So that's enough about me and about uh, me talking even. We're going to jump straight in. And before we go and start talking about the topic and the, the big question that we have for today, let's acknowledge that the fact that we have two people here that absolutely love remote working. And the first question should be, where are you in the world today? Why? Well, I was, for those who know, over the weekends, Richard Branson finally made it to space. And maybe in a few years, both of us, Pilar and I, could be giving an interview from space or someone else, uh, something like that. So where are you today? Is you, are you in space? <laughs> are you asking me or the audience, Naily? <laughs> well, well, actually, good question. If you could all please let me know where you are in space, um, <laughs> where you are today. And Pilar, where are you today? Well. I'm, I'm actually in uh, in Spain, in the province of Alicante, uh, oh, enjoying some lovely weather. Uh, so yeah, I've been here. I'm I'm here for a, for a little while. I'm usually based oh. in London, though. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. I'm actually in Madrid at the moment, and I'm back in Cambridge on Monday. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, Pilar, you have such an extensive career in the remote world. And again, most of our other people watching us, they will get to know a bit more about you and exactly how you help your clients as well. And I like to say that you've seen it all because you've started way before we had these ideas of hybrid working and the pa pandemic. So you've seen it from the moment where there was a lot of resistance from people to kind of jump into this idea of people working from home to where it is now, where there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of um, where well, some people know what they want to do and some people are still looking for solution. Before we even start and dive into our question, uh, I'd like to understand from you, especially from your, you know, what you've seen, what do you see the difference between remote working and hybrid working? So pretty much remote working as it used to be back in the days and what we have now. As I see it, uh, well, remote organizations would be organizations where everyone is working apart from each other. Uh, and remote working then is working away from other people physically, <laughs> physically, not emotionally. And then hybrid working as it's being developed uh, and as we've uh, known of it before is a mixture of being co-located. So using mm -hmm. the same space uh, together and using another space when we're away from each other, mainly working from home. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, at the moment, this hybrid workplace can look a million different ways. It can mean that some people use the office every now and then ad hoc at different times, or it could be that there's a decision that everyone has to come and work together at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So um, before the pandemic, I used to talk a lot about office optional, which is a term that one of my podcast guests uh, uh, came <laughs> up with, because that is, for me, the, 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 the dream is that um, mm -hmm. organizations do, especially larger one, I suppose, uh, do have an office or space that some people can go to. Mm -hmm but that if people don't want to use that office then that's fine as well so the mm. the, the remo at the end of the day we're we're all remote workers if we're working with yeah. people away from each other because mm. you are in the office you're working remotely with someone who's not in the office so that, that mm. i think that's also a, a, a mindset to start to develop 
Yeah, and I quite like the what you've what you've said about office op optional as well. And I guess when we start looking at this concept of office optional, do you think that it makes or even this is just to say I think this is one of the questions I get a lot. The idea that um, going with office optional might make life a bit more difficult for managers, difficult for organization to be able to connect. What do you think about that? Yes. As soon as we have options and as soon as we want more flexibility and more options for the individual, if there's a lot of us and we have to coordinate those options, we have to make all those options work, it does become more complicated. The idea behind uh, distributed work, the idea behind mm -hmm. having options and flexibility is that in the end, we become happier within ourselves and so we're yeah. better collaborators. To get there is difficult, and um, you will have heard many remote advocates when when the hybrid thing started to hit. We're like, ah, brace yourselves, because <laughs> we know that being all together all the time is one thing. Being all dispersed, distributed is one thing, but this mm. middle where there's connection, agreement, coordination, preferences versus other preferences, that's when it starts to get mm. difficult and interesting. Yeah. And I guess what are some of the challenges you've seen in the space and the people you've spoken to when they they kind of want to embrace the more uh, office optional aspect of the hybrid one rather than the remote one? Yeah. So the um, the the who is around question is a big one. But that but to be honest, that that's one that is so um, you just need to sit down and coordinate. This is just a matter mm -hmm. of coordination. I think what so, so let, let me just go back to the experience of mm. remote work that m many people have had, uh, which has mainly been during the pandemic. Is just we many organic people have just tried to do things the way they were doing them in the office, but online. Mm. So, um, companies that have been set up fully distributed or teams that have been set up as fully distributed from the beginning have a certain way of communicating that is almost mm. time agnostic. A lot of the time, definitely place agnostic. So. Com um, organizations who were not remote from the beginning and didn't have this thing cracked are still struggling with that. They're still struggling with, okay, if we want to make a decision, even if it's a long-term one that's not urgent, we need to have a meeting. Whereas <laughs> the distributor organizations know that you can also do it through a document. You can do it in ways in which you take a week with people inputting in different ways. And then maybe you meet at the end or in the middle of the process. So that is the main challenge. The main challenge is that we still have old ways of collaborating. And so uh, we, we still need to crack, okay, if we now have a location independence or an option, how do we need to change the way in which we work? Yes. Yeah, that's it. No that's answers, a really, questions. really good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really good question to start with. But um, in fact, uh, just big shout out to Maria from Lisbon and Portugal and Eiji and from Chester and Mars. <laughs> well, I think it's in the UK. <laughs> so already we have uh, three different uh, countries here, which is amazing. Nice. And uh, just going back on, on the topic, I quite like what you said. It's about, and I think the biggest problem that we're seeing, as you're saying, is that people are still thinking about the old ways or the traditional ways of working and trying to get them to squeeze and fit into their hybrid work rather than reimagining. And I think that is um, what is really, really causing some of the pains. So do you have any kind of tips and ideas on how people, or I can even question, because I love your questions, right? On what managers and leaders need to start thinking or need to start asking themselves to get to different answers, rather than just, as you, you show the example of the meeting, just going back to what were you we were doing before and just do it straight into this new world. Yeah. So the reason why I became interested in the virtual space and helping mm -hmm. organizations work in that was because in order to do that, we had to stop and see how we were operating and question the ways in which we were collaborating, working together, and then make some decisions and try some stuff out. Because mm. in order to go virtual, we knew we had to change. Yeah. Uh, so that is the first thing. It's okay, the team processes we have, the ways mm. in which we have been doing them, is that the best way? Or is that just because it's the way it's always been? So that's number one, is this is, this is the moment to stop thinking about location. Just sit down with your team or whatever, or, or or stand up with your team or whatever you want to do <laughs> and think about, okay, is this the way we want to be uh, working? The mm -hmm. other thing is, 
I, I think it would help to think about your, you, everyone as a remote team. So stop talking about hybrid uh, for the reasons I was saying, because of, you know, you want a, as many options still. But also, what is the common space for a knowledge worker, which is the workforce we're talking about? The common space is the online space because we do emails, because we do documents online, because most of our work gets done online. So that's the common space. So let's be thinking that that is our common space. And then where people are located is a different story. The other thing is that we have to really heighten our awareness of a lot of different stuff. So from the point of view, if you're talking managers and leaders specifically, what do we want? And one, can we get that in the way we're operating now? Two, mm. are we imposing that on the team? <laughs> Have we checked in that the way we've been doing this, and this often happens, is just the way that suits me best, but actually it's probably not the best for the team or for the work as a whole. And so now when we're having more options, it's being very aware of what are our preferences so that we're not mm -hmm. imposing them and so that we're not taking the teams along. You often see a team in many ways, the same as with um, startups, they absorb the founder's way of working or the team and the same with the team manager a lot a lot of the time. So there's there's all of there's all of that. I, I'll stop now before I <laughs> lose my thread. <laughs> no, no, I was actually enjoy enjoying this thread. And I love, I really love what you said about absorbing the, the way of working of the leaders and the managers. I was speaking to some clients and one of the issues that they had was that as a manager, they just love having people around them. And thought that was the main reason why they wanted to go back in the office. And a lot of people are saying, well, you know, when you go back to the office, we are more productive. But, you know, if you're using the right tools as well. And again, you're talking about what you said earlier as well, about the change of mindsets of not wanting to just bring everything together, but think about the processes and think about how they could do things a little bit more differently as well. And another one that always comes up as well, when you because we looked at this idea of changing of um, thinking about the processes, and also how to communicate in terms of uh, knowledge workers. But what about new people? Because that's something that comes up over, over again. A lot of people saying that, you know, onboarding of recruiting and especially onboarding and making new people welcome and part of the, the, the company is, is how they actually, some of people even say that it cannot be done. They will never feel part of the company and they will never really feel part of the culture. What are your thoughts on that? I think that comes from thinking that we were together in the office, mm -hmm. then we've gone remote, and that person has missed out on that history. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of yourself as a fully remote company and stop thinking about the fact that you were in the office or that things were like this before, then you're just welcoming the person into your organization, mm -hmm. however that is. Yeah. That new person has not experienced your organization as it was. So I think we've got to also start thinking about that, that there is a whole history that we're still carrying with us. Yeah. The other thing is that I am i don't think distributed companies have ever had a problems onboarding people. <laughs> and they've worked very hard at designing processes which include, okay, you come, you're, you're new into the company. We give you, mm -hmm. for example, Buffer, their culture buddy, which is one person mm -hmm. that will look after you, maybe not even in your team, but that, that just helps you to navigate the organization at the beginning of the first few months. And then you have mm -hmm. maybe your team buddy, which is the person which maybe accompanies you mostly to help you around the team and other things. Yes. So, we've got to do that. We can't leave that to chance because, yeah, if it were in a physical space, then that person might just find someone who unofficially will do this, but in the remote space, it will not happen. So you've got that. You have um, you have to be very structured. So I'm, I've just finished a really, really lovely um, job with a small team in Spain. Mm -hmm. And they are great. They onboard people. They really, they, they really, um, they integrate them. Uh, Mark Kilby from, uh, who's one of my online friends, talks about integration <laughs> rather than onboarding, which I love. Mm -hmm. And they have a great process, but they're reinventing it at every time someone comes on because they haven't designed it and structured it. And so I was working with them on giving it some structure, just seeing, okay, what is working, what's working for everyone, having checklists just to make sure that we're not missing. And this is not about only the um, practical stuff like this. This person have the login details for this, blah, blah. Maybe it could also be 
has this person uh, in the first two months commented in the open in if it's a small team mm -hmm. in a slack or is this person appearing at all do they know we have these different channels so it's mm -hmm. you need to really look at what it would look like for a person to be fully integrated and then keep an eye out for that um and yes and, and that is a big worry now for for people well, what do we do with uh, newcomers and some people because there were loads of them during the pandemic people who joined the organizations in the mm -hmm. middle of the pandemic as well and some of them are saying well i really feel like i want to meet people i've never <laughs> been been with them but other people are saying well actually it's great i've just got to meet so many people that probably if i've been onboarded in the office i wouldn't yeah. have because i've met people from all layers of the organization. So I think it really needs a much more deliberate and structured approach, which is one of the problems. I don't know if you found this when you're trying to switch to working in a remote way, you have to have lots of processes that you would do spontaneously as humans. And so it feels like you're, uh, when you mention documentation, when you mention processes, everyone's like, oh, that's, you know, that you're dehumanizing it. Maybe, but unless you plan for it and you structure it that humanizing aspect is not coming out so it's the same for for the onboarding i think can i can i plug actually let me in case anyone is watching and they want to know more on onboarding and they go pilar that's great but um the last episode of the 21st century work life podcast which is the podcast for virtual not distant has a lovely piece on onboarding with uh nadia vatalidis from remote and the, the episode before that is about hiring remotely. So if anyone is interested, check check that out. Oh, have I lost you, Naily? I can't hear you. Yes, you did. Oh, but it was oh I'm glad it was you, <laughs> not my Microsoft setting. <laughs> So, yeah, and, <laughs> and so now you're over. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so we we are going to put up the details of the 21st century podcast on the screen up in in a moment, and also on the chat as well. And for anyone who's actually have any questions, please do ask questions. They are a great opportunity. We've got Peter here. Ask questions, and then we'll we'll bring them up as well. And again, going back to the topic on the, the on, onboarding as well. And again, it's, it's pretty much as you're saying, it's the same thread that goes all the way through this idea of uh, thinking about what you are doing, being really conscious about a decision, about the different steps that you are taking. Because some of them used to happen. Now mm -hmm. you need to think about how they are going to happen as well. And for anyone just joining, we really start looking at this idea of reimagining is really goes way beyond just how many days we go in the office. You look at your processes, you look at knowledge sharing, you look at onboarding, which we just talked about as well. And I guess one of the things we were talking about when we were looking at the, actually, first question, I have so many questions for you. But one, before we move on to the communication aspect, because I want to touch a bit on asynchronous communication, as you mentioned some of that throughout, one of the things that I sometimes discuss with people is, are we moving too fast? into this hybrid working? Uh, do you think that some companies are more than reacting without really doing the homework, which are all of the steps that we've been talking about so far in, the, in, the, in this episode? I'm not sure. I think that's mm. the impression I, get, I would get if I only looked at what's being put out there. Like all mm. these plans, this person's doing this and this company said that and that company. But actually when I then talk to people who are not broadcasting as much, I'm seeing there's been a lot of surveying employees uh, mm -hmm. really understanding why some employees want to continue not working remotely, but working from home all, mm -hmm. uh, only and really trying to understand what people want from the office and what people want from um, from whatever other option. And I actually I saw a lot of this even last summer 2020, like a lot of surveying, mm -hmm. a lot of asking, really trying to understand. And then some organizations, I was talking to someone the other day who they've been working all year and they're thinking, well, maybe in June, in sorry, in January 2022, we'll start to roll this out. Uh, mm. So some are, and so, and I think that um, for some organizations, I think they're just, it, it's too much, they're going first to look at the practical details rather than the more, uh, the, the stuff that we are talking about. <laughs> but on the whole, I'm thinking that that, that maybe they are taking their time. And in fact, I, mm. I have also heard in some organizations, people thinking, oh, I don't know what's going on. 
which mm -hmm. sometimes is lack of communication, but sometimes it's actually that nobody's making decisions because we're weighing and we're seeing what other people are yes. doing, etc. Mm -hmm. um, something I wanted to say around this, yes. Now, the reason, the other reason why I think it should even be a slower and more phased approach is that in a lot of countries we're still we still have pandemic restrictions. Yeah. So how this hybrid model or how this starting to use the office again model is going to pan out while there's still restrictions is very mm -hmm. different. And that's what I'm not hearing enough because yes. the difference between saying, oh, it'll be great because we'll have meetings in the office because we'll do water cooler, but everyone's wearing masks. Someone I heard someone ask me the other day, what do I do if I've been seeing the avatar of someone in the organization, not in my team, uh, mm -hmm. or even seen them in, in, a, in a video, but, but I'm new to the organization, so I've never met them in person. And then I see them in the office, but they're wearing a mask and I'm not sure if it's mm -hmm. them. And those kind of things, <laughs> it's not, and, and we have to ha have spacing. So I'm thinking, I would actually say, when you start using the office again, use it for whatever, give the people who are working from home who don't have the space to go and mm -hmm. work there from the office with a really good chair equipment that they might not yeah. have at home. But maybe still, this, people are going to hate this, but for example, maybe still have your meetings online because mm -hmm. they might be more comfortable. Um, you never know, and especially if it's a hybrid meeting, just have it when everyone is at home where they don't need the mask, etc. rather than uh, uh, half of the people in the office with the mask, the social distancing, we don't have a room each, so we have to have a camera again. You know, you go back to all these <laughs> images from before the pandemic that we're like, no, don't do it like yes. that. So, so yeah, so I think that there are many organizations taking their time. I just wish they were more deliberately finding these two faces going through pandemic back into the office and then something that will be a bit more long term. Oh wow, that's 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 impressive. I'm really glad you you mentioned that because mm. a lot of people are asking themselves that question especially Monday being uh, at least in the UK that's the day where there's going to be a push for people to come back in the office. But what happened is, like you just said, you know, we are in that transition period and wearing the mask and how do we start socializing and being part of the community again, whilst a lot of other people might still be at home. And if they, for companies that have people in the other country, something that you mentioned earlier in this episode as well, is looking at remote teams, right? And even that, most people are not even thinking about those as well. Yeah. So that's that's really that's a really good uh, uh, nugget there. And again, for anybody watching, please do send us your question. And if there's anything that uh, Pilar said so far that resonates with you, do put it in the comments as well. As we love to know those kind of things as well. Now, when we're still going down the this idea of communication, because that's the, really the hardest one. And I definitely love the what you just mentioned about. Should we maybe we should continue with uh, thinking about how we structure the meeting? Maybe especially if we have people that are not in the office, keep it uh, keep it um, kind of online. The same goes with communication in general. So when we start looking at this aspect of asynchronous communications, a lot of people are really struggling with not we're having discussions online. So how have you helped your clients to feel a bit more comfortable? And if that's possible, but I'm sure with you that will be. But how have you <laughs> helped your clients to feel more comfortable with sharing information sh online on, on platforms like Slack or Microsoft Teams or whatever they are using? So something I discovered when I started working last year with, uh, mm -hmm. with teams that have been forced into working apart from each other, and we're using technology to stay connected was how much of a preference it is to work asynchronously or not. Not just that, it's about how you see work, how you think about work, how you structure your work, what your process is like. And I was thinking, well, I never realized that actually asynchronous communication, how we've known it in the online space where we have long discussions, where we have comments in documents, where mm -hmm. we uh, capture our thoughts for others to see, where we check in maybe every day just with, with short nuggets of information about what's going on, is that actually that is uh, very suited to a certain style of working and a certain mm -hmm. style communication so um what i found is a huge diversity so i'll give you an example um when we talk so for for, for viewers who are new to, to who have, well, 
not that are new to working online, that haven't had the time to think about working online because this has been the problem. Yeah. Everyone's been working so hard that they haven't had time to really learn how to embrace this space. And so one of the examples is when we're working as a distributed company um, and people have, for example, flexible schedules or people like to engage with each other at different times. So we use non-real-time communication, which most of the time is still text-based. So we might have, it might say, eh, Naily, I've had an idea for another live show. <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> it, it might be, we might be the kind of team that in the past would say, okay, let's meet. Let's meet to discuss, let's brainstorm, blah, blah, blah. But in a distributed team, that might be difficult. It also might not be the best moment. So we said, okay, I'm going to put a proposal. I'm going to start a document. I'm going to write five lines about my thoughts. This is my idea. This is how I see it pan out. And then I'm going to wait one or two days because this is not urgent. We're talking about non-urgent decisions. And so Naily and Naomi and other team members throughout will go and they'll comment in the document, this line. Well, this, oh yeah, I agree that. What do you think? And there'll be a thread around it. And we'll have a document with a conversation. So we're starting to use a document that is traditionally used as a document, like hardcore thing, report or whatever. <laughs> it's now a conversation tool. And I think that's a big mindset shift. So mm -hmm. we look at that and we think, and then eventually we go, you know what? We're almost there. Let's just iron this out by having a meeting. And then we have a meeting and the meeting is half an hour because we've already conversed. We've already used all this asynchronous communication. So I was explaining this to, to a group of managers and there were quite a few that said, no, no, no. Important decisions need to be made in real time in a meeting. Mm -hmm. If it's an important decision, it has to be made real time. And someone else saying, actually, no. We would do, it would do us a lot of good in this organization to stop and use a written mm -hmm. approach, which will help us to reflect. So you can see the huge diversity. So the yeah. person who's, uh, maybe that's the main way in which they've always made decisions with other people is by coming together, talking at the same time. And this thing where, what, I have to read and write and converse, it, <laughs> it can be very alien. So um, mm -hmm. it's really about understanding what can help the team and whether team members will embrace this kind of thing uh, and and then and playing with it actually but not saying oh that, that that's not well it's a different way of working now so let's try it let's try it for well, however a few weeks mm -hmm. then name it review it see how it goes and in fact as you're saying it's actually giving us another option to start again reimagining how we're doing things before yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just I'll just add that now I'm going to get on my soapbox now. <laughs> go <laughs> for it. Sure go many, for it. Many people will agree with me, especially if there's any remote advocates there. Maybe, mm -hmm. Naily, you agree with me with this. You could say that the way in which the knowledge work has been approached has been favoring a kind mm -hmm. of working. So we come into the office every day, we're with lots of people, we have meetings which have all the thinking there and all the sharing and all the decisions are made in meetings, blah, blah, blah. And now those of us who are working in a remote fashion and with certain kind of organizations and teams are like, okay, now we have to slow down. Now you're giving me time to reflect. Now you're giving me space to communicate in writing throughout the week rather than during half an hour on Wednesday morning, which my head yeah. might not be there. Um, now you are allowing me to communicate with you in the afternoon rather than a nine o'clock Monday morning meeting. And you know, it's, and I'm thinking yeah. that the way that we in which we've been working has been favoring a certain kind of work style so i think now it's maybe time to level the playing field yeah and i i do agree um to, especially when we start looking at personality types which is, which is the topic that i'm quite fair um, i quite love what i've seen in organization i do a lot of work with tech companies and there are some tech uh, tech people that are really deep thinkers and whenever mm -hmm. you ask a question you put a problem out there they need to have the time to think Whereas the way we work is usually like, let's go to a meeting room. We're going to talk about this. Maybe not even giving people the time to think about this. People come up with ideas. But what happened, there's an endless loop of meetings to talk about the same topic. When we were in the meeting, people were thinking, but, you know, depending on your personality types, you might want to think 
without having lots of noise coming at you. But you don't have the opportunity. So what happened, you give your best at the meeting, but then when you go home and have a coffee, I'm going to, oh, crap, I could have said this and this and that, right? Yeah. And this calls for another meeting to discuss it. And whereas if you had something like you're talking, it's not urgent. Again, that's a really good point to emphasize. If it's not urgent and we have the time, how about give the time and slow down, give the time to people to think and be at their best and work at their best as well? Yeah. 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 So I guess, again, for anyone watching, if you have any question, please do send them through. And we are going to move on to one really exciting part. Again, I've been waiting for this since the beginning, this idea of internal podcasting as well. So to get there, I will share with you a, 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 a story of how I met Pillar. Um, yeah. The first time I think I've seen Pillar, I, it was at a conference. It was a conference last year. It was an online conference, and I dropped by your booth because I was presenting at the uh... ah at the Nomad City, which is not yes. people. Ah, that's <laughs> yes, oh, wow. oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I was uh, I was speaking at uh, Repeople on uh, designing a remote um, designing a workplace playground. And once I, I was done with my talk, I started looking around and you popped up. I thought, oh, well, I'm just going to go and <laughs> to fill us both. And I, I really love what you were saying. And I was oh, wow, this is impressive. So I started following you on social media. Mm -hmm. Then out of the blue, you started running a course on helping people create podcasts. And I thought, hmm, adventures in podcasting. Love the name. It sounded so attractive. I already heard you talk. I'm like, well, if Peter's running this, I have to get in. And we worked together. And a few weeks later, here we go. I've got my own podcast as well. So yeah. when we were planning this and I thought one of the guests I have to have is Pillar. And if you can talk to us a little bit about your journey with the 21st century, uh, your, comp uh, your company virtual non-distance, and uh, how you came about and now into work from where you started, which is a great story, and all the way to starting this internal podcasting and how you are reimagining the world of work for the, the pretty much the next phase, really. Yeah, thanks. So the fact that I'm a podcaster will say a lot to people watching who don't know me. <laughs> and that's that I really like podcasting because it's it's very intimate, but it's also somewhere where I can lose myself in talking to imaginary listeners. So uh, I don't need to be seeing the listeners. I'm there. They're in my mind. You know, this is how yeah. I work. So as someone who uh, has always wanted to have a radio show, let's face mm -hmm. it, and I'm also a performer as well. So uh, I, I have oh. I have no fear of uh, being behind a microphone. I work as a voiceover for many years. So I did have that. Um, and um, I wrote a book about Spain, the A to Z of Spanish culture. And then it had oh, the wow. audiobook version. And I thought, what can I do to promote the book? So I started a podcast called Spain Uncovered. But then when <laughs> I set up Virtual Not Distant a few years ago, I thought, and actually, no, the podcast came before Virtual Not Distant. I started run, um, I set up 21st Century Work Life. And the podcast initially was about how the world of work and our attitudes to work are changing. So it was really wide. Mm -hmm. And I just found lots of people I knew and who I wanted to catch up with. And I invited them on. I was co-hosting with Lisette Sutherland from Collaboration Superpowers. Mm -hmm. She was the co-host um, every other episode for for many episodes, for many episodes. Then she went and finished her book. <laughs> and now mm -hmm. I'm working with uh, Maya Middle Miss as a co-host. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that podcast was what really um, gave me a lot of insight into how distributed companies were working, how people were doing things differently, how managers and team leaders approached the whole distance thing. And what I saw was that the, the show was being seen as a show about remote work and online collaboration. Mm -hmm. So now that's all we cover. So it was very broad. Mm -hmm. In doing this, um, I've realized, and, and also I'm a, I'm a podcast listener, that you really get to know the person. So for example, I, many years ago, I ran an open workshop and somebody came and they liked the show. And then, and then a few years later, I did an in-house at their company. And he came to me and said, oh, I've done, I did your workshop when you did the open one, but I wanted to come back. I listened to your show. And he's like a selfie and everything. Now that just from me basically going into his ear. And I thought, well, you've got the external thing and it's great for promoting yourself. It's great for spreading the message. It's great just to have a platform and it's a lot of fun. But if you think of what would it feel like in an organization of 
I don't know, 50 people, 100, 2,000, 20,000 to have an internal radio show. So uh, just an internal podcast that is curated and created and uh, produced by a small team of people. And the, um, the purpose of this is not to have the top-down approach where you always have, okay, the, the CEO talking or the senior leadership about the great news about the company. But what you do is you start to find people who have interesting stories to tell and by that, I mean uh, people who have, I don't know, teams that are doing something differently, teams that are experimenting with new ways of working, people that are role modeling um, the behaviors of the values, uh, who are role modeling the values of your organization, uh, people who want to thank other people. And what you do is you create an audio community around it. Yeah. So. I think it's got a lot of potential. I'm going to be completely transparent. I haven't done it yet. And I know that it's been done and it's being done. But I'm really thinking the difference is that it's really about creating that sense around you of people in the organization and things happening that you might not have if you're away from each other and if you're distributed or if you're coming to the office once or twice every two weeks or something like that mm -hmm. so it's really about finding ways of keeping people connected that does not involve being in a meeting especially online <laughs> so it's i don't know i don't know if you have any questions or if that's what you thought it was uh, but that's that's where i'm going next and i'm i'm very yeah. excited about it now, I absolutely love the idea. Again, as uh, we're talking about reimagining, because it actually takes me back to the earliest years of LinkedIn and even social media, but LinkedIn in particular. When LinkedIn first started, it was most people might, it was still professional, but organization was trying to push their messaging through the brand. But now, organization are literally pushing their messaging through the people within the yeah. teams. So if something happened, you might find, and especially if they, they want to celebrate, you might find different people within the organization We put message on their personal profile, but sharing their own views and their own feelings. And I think that comes out a lot stronger. So why not do it also internally, as you're saying about giving the voice of other people. When we have all hands meeting or those kind of top down meetings you're talking about, usually you hear from the management, but you don't know what the next team, you know, next door, are, what they're doing as well. So sometimes you might want to find out a bit more about that and having a, internal podcast could be a way of moving away from taking all the meetings that you had before and yes. trying to put bring them online right yeah so yeah. this way you have a space and create a community which is completely completely different yeah and also and I guess a, it's part, oh, yeah. very quickly yeah, it's ahead, also sorry. giving a space to people whose work is not very visible in the yes. company because for whatever mm -hmm. so we we can bring those those voices in as well Yes, exactly. And I guess um, for me, this is something I would definitely keep in mind as a way of uh, when I talk to organization and think, hey, have you checked out the internal podcasting a woman? She's, <laughs> she should just really get help her to help you out as well. Because a lot of companies, especially whenever we start talking about the frictions between different or silos between different departments, it usually comes from a lack of understanding or knowledge of what's happening on the other side. Now, if you had an internal podcast, again, it's such a nice way of people to, rather than have the, like a campfire or meetings, again, moving away from we all have to be at the same time, at the meeting, you have a podcast and people can really come on and it's very, it's laid back. You don't have to spend hours on creating slides, you know, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. a really interesting way of um, getting people to talk about what they're doing and really create, like you say, creating this community. Yeah. And the listening is flexible because you can do it at any yes. point. You can do it away from the computer, which is one of the reasons that now is a good time. We just want to get people away from the screens. So if we can do it through audio, that's great. Yes, definitely. And one thing that uh, that you've mentioned, you, you, you talked about being a voice, an established voiceover as well. Can yes. you please share that with us? Because I went out already, I was like, oh, this is really exciting. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to you to share that. My, my, par my parallel career, which, uh, which is, <laughs> it, it's probably starting to come to an end, I think, but it's my parallel mm -hmm. career um, that I've been doing since 1998. Mm -hmm. And I've done all kinds of things. But if any of your viewers, uh, viewers, if any of you watch the Go Jetters with your children, I am the voice of the pilot. <laughs> so, so that was that was great. It's a four seasons of cartoon work 
which is my dream. That was my dream. That was like, okay, I can leave now. You know, when you can say I can retire, I've done what I wanted to do. Um, it's a wonderful job. Uh, and, but it's an industry that's really changed. Mm. So it used to be that I, I work in London as a Spanish voiceover. So you'd go to a studio, mm. do your thing. And then even before the pandemic, a lot of the work was already going to home studios, maybe in Spain for more local mm. voices and stuff like that. And I decided not to go down that route because of practical reasons in my flat. Mm. I didn't want to do that. So the, the, the industry is changing. It's been interesting to see how it evolves. It's a great job. It's basically you go and they give you a script and you read it and <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> and I get to, I've done video games. I've done, I've listened, I've heard myself on an airplane. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to whatever it was. It's, it's, so, uh, my mother heard me in a museum somewhere with a narration. It's a great job. Oh, brilliant. Well, there's another thing. If anyone's looking for voiceover. <laughs> um, and well, just to finish off, because I, I can speak to you all day, but let's just, uh, just to wrap up. <laughs> Yeah, so again, if anyone wanted to find out more about what you do, especially when it comes to the new, the new streams of, of your business that are still part of the virtual distance. And uh, do you want to share with us again how um, and people can connect with you and find out more about the adventures in podcasting, which I thought was a brilliant program. I was on it and here I am today. And also on the internal podcasting work that you're doing as well. Yeah, so the virtual, not distant stuff, which is the internal podcasting and all the training for managers of remote teams, that virtualnotdistant.com. If mm -hmm. you don't want to talk about that and you just want to uh, set up your own podcast for whatever reason, it's a lot of fun and you get to meet really cool people, <laughs> uh, then <laughs> go to adventuresinpodcasting.com and message me through there. Um, Pilar Orti on Twitter and find me on LinkedIn. Brilliant. And we will have all the links up as well uh, when we put the description on the show for those who watch it on YouTube uh, or anywhere else you're watching that as well. So before before we go, first of all, thank you for everybody that's watching now or whenever. And if you have any question, as Peter said, you know now how to find her. And if you have any question for Athena leaders, please let us know. We are going to continue doing those lives every week. And one thing that we want to do in August as well is to have something a bit more motiv motivational as because August, you know, is about this connection. So I'm looking at speaking to startups and entrepreneurs who are rolling up their sleeves and building new products and new ideas together. And just to talk a little bit more about the experience through the pandemic and also their visions for the future. So if you know anyone who's interested, please let, put them in touch with me. That would be great to bring some more inspiration as we're going to August and we are disconnecting, even though we keep when we remain connected at work as well, but not during the holidays, of course. <laughs> so before, and for our last, last final parting word, Pillar, if you had one, one piece of advice or one key takeaway that you want the listener to take today as we are embracing this new world of work, what would it be? Don't make assumptions about what is going to work and how. Oh, brilliant. I love that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Pilar, and thanks, uh, thanks a lot to everybody else and for all the listeners as well. See you at the next show. Let's design a happy and productive workplace playground together. <laughs>